The Sony A9 III is touted as the world's first full-frame global shutter sensor that can shoot an insane 120 raw 24 megapixel photos a second. It will film 4K up to 120 frames a second. It has an amazing eight stops of dynamic stabilization for handheld shots and the incredible AI autofocus system that Sony's been putting in their new cameras. But before we jump into the video, you need to know that I don't work with Sony. Sony doesn't work with me. As far as I know, they don't even know my channel exists. I have gotten loaner equipment through my Sony Pro support plan that I pay for, but in this case, my buddy Jeb and Doby came up here to hang out with me for three days so that we could test this camera and this lens in as many situations as possible here in Alaska. The A93 takes fantastic photos. That shouldn't be surprising. This is one of their top of the line photo centric cameras. What sets it apart though, isn't really even the global shutter. We will talk about that more in a minute, but it's the fact that the 24.6 megapixel sensor can shoot 120 raw photos per second. Now 120 frames a second might seem insane, but if you're shooting and photographing anything that happens really fast, 120 frames a second is actually really crucial to ensure that you don't actually miss the shot. So this camera is definitely aimed at people who work in high stakes environment like sports or wildlife where you can't afford to miss the shot. One of the only problems is that 120 frames fills up the buffer in the camera extremely quickly. But if you use CF Express Type A cards, the buffer will clear relatively quickly and get you back up and running in just a couple of seconds. And especially if you don't shoot the full 120 frames, if you just do short little bursts at that speed, then the buffer can actually clear and almost keep up with you pretty quickly. All of these sequences here were shot at 120 raw photos per second in burst. And this is where the AI autofocus system that Sony's been putting into their last few cameras really comes into play. It locks insanely quickly on the eye of birds or people or whatever you might be shooting and captures perfectly in focus shots, in my experience at least, with near 100% accuracy. I did get a few out of focus shots, but most of those were because I was moving the camera extremely fast in comparison to what my shutter speed was set for on this long lens. And while we're gonna cover stabilization more later in the video, this is where the eight stops of stabilization in the dynamic active stabilization mode really come in handy. Handheld panning shots on a 600 millimeter lens and you still get sharp photos. So while obviously this camera is going to work incredibly well for people who are photographing wildlife, and especially because it has a pre-roll where it's constantly capturing photos beforehand, and as soon as you press the shutter button, it will save photos up to however long you set it to save before that, which means you really won't miss a shot when it comes to wildlife. But a lot of my work here in Alaska involves filming and shooting around helicopters. And this time of year specifically, it involves a lot of heli skiing. And this is where the global shutter really comes into play. Because the global sensor reads out the entire scene all at once, instead of a rolling shutter, which means it reads out from top to bottom, you get perfectly straight lines no matter how fast you're panning from side to side. Or in my case, because of the work I do with helicopters, it means the rotor blades and the tail rotor blades of the helicopter are always perfectly straight. But one of the big downsides of a global shutter sensor is that you, in many cases you give up some dynamic range in order to have that global shutter. So one of the things I really wanted to check and test was how much dynamic range the A9 III had in it, especially in photo modes. Here are some examples of shooting in the widest dynamic range I can think of, shooting a black subject against sunlit clouds in the background. Here you can see before and after. So while the A9 III might suffer a little bit in dynamic range, in practical use, I did not notice a difference. My normal camera, the A1, is a fantastic photo camera. It takes incredible photos. And honestly, I would have gotten to the same place doing the same shots with the A1 that I did with the A9. So I didn't see in practical use a huge difference in the amount of dynamic range available in photos on this camera. And really quickly, we need to talk about noise. While most of these were shot at pretty high shutter speeds and fairly high ISOs, I wanted to shoot a few at extremely high ISO 
to make sure to get a good idea of what the noise performance is. So these photos were shot at 10,000 or 12,800 ISO, and you can see the before and after I used Lightroom noise reduction in post. But because I'm a hybrid shooter and a solo creator, it means I'm shooting both photo and video on the same camera all of the time. So how does the video quality hold up? Because this has 10-bit 422 color science, we can use S-Log3, which gives us the most amount of dynamic range available in this camera. And in practical use, again, the video out of this camera is stunning. The 4K 120 looks absolutely incredible. And again, here is where the global shutter really shines. Because you don't need to worry about rolling shutter, warping, or bending any straight lines, you can capture some really spectacular video of very fast moving objects and know that there will be no distortion in any way on any of those fast moving subjects. But the biggest potential problem with this camera is the limited ISO range available. Because of the global shutter, Sony set the base ISO in S-Log3 at ISO 2000, which is pretty good, definitely means you're gonna need ND filters for bright situations, or you're gonna to have to stop the lens way down. But they also cap the ISO in video modes at 25,000. So one of the biggest questions I have about the A93 is how the low light performance is. Because I live in Alaska and because it's dark so much of the year and I do a ton of low light shooting, I really wanna see how well the camera performs against something like the A7S III, which is the absolute low light king. I don't expect it to get anywhere close, but I think, I don't know, with the tests we've been doing so far, the, the camera's been pretty surprising on how well it handles low light. One thing that Gerald Undone pointed out is that it seems to clean up at ISO 6400. And while I did notice something similar on this one, it's interesting to me that the noise profile doesn't dramatically change even up to ISO 20,000 or 25,000. The noise doesn't appear to degrade the image like it does in many other Sony cameras, where you start to lose definition and you start to lose some of the color clarity that should be in the image. Overall, I would say the noise performance of the A93 is actually pretty impressive, but you have to have realistic expectations. If you're gonna film things at very, very high ISOs like 20,000 or 25,000, you are gonna have noise. Now the noise does clean up nicely with programs like Neat Video or Topaz, but you are gonna have to process it in post in order to get a clean image. Hey, if you're enjoying this video or getting value out of it, then consider subscribing. My goal is to help other solo creators like myself make good decisions when it comes to purchasing gear, but also to use that gear to its fullest potential by giving you tips and tutorials on how to use it and get the most out of it. And here's another place where the dynamic active stabilization really comes into play. Filming handheld video with this camera means you get almost gimbal-like shots, even if you're walking through deep snow or stumbling over a path, the footage that comes out of the camera is incredibly smooth and really usable. I would have no problem using this camera handheld, even on longer lenses, without a gimbal for client work because the footage that comes out of it is so good and so smooth. Everything about this camera is fast. And this is where the AI autofocus system that Sony's been putting in the last few cameras really comes into play. Because a camera can film so quickly and because the autofocus responds so quickly and adapts so fast, it means you're gonna miss a lot less shots. The autofocus system in every situation I tried it in, whether it was backlit subjects or whether it was a dark subject with a black eye that it still was able to pick out or it was very underexposed, very dark situations, the autofocus system performed extremely well and really does help make sure that your shots are gonna be in focus. You can, of course, use something like tap to focus, or if you're using lens with direct manual focus, you can get it to where you want it. And then as soon as I got it on like the Eagle here, it definitely locked on and stayed locked on the eye, even though there was a lot of foreground elements. But what was really surprising to me was how well the autofocus system worked in low light in this situation here 
we were well past the sun going down, probably by about an hour and a half, and we were shooting at 20,000, 25,000 ISO in order to capture these shots. The autofocus definitely locked on the subjects that we wanted it to, when we wanted it to, and occasionally using tap to focus to make sure it was on the right subject, it worked almost flawlessly. The new ergonomics and body design of the A93 made it really nice to use, and especially in my case, because I'm out in the cold a lot, having gloves on, the new body style with the larger buttons or the easier to reach buttons really made a big difference on being able to get the shots, change the modes, change settings, whatever I need to do without having to take my gloves off, which I do a lot of time with my other cameras. And two of my favorite features that need to be on all Sony cameras going forward are the multi-function switch here where you can quickly switch between video and photo modes and you can have three memory slots per mode. So three for photo, three for video, and three for S and Q mode, which is fantastic when you're running and gunning like me and you've really got to change your modes fast. The camera switches modes almost instantly and is ready to go by the time you get it back up to your eye and are ready to start shooting. But the other thing that needs to be standard on all Sony cameras going forward is this new type of screen that can be flipped out, it can be rotated, it can be bent up or bent down. This is by far the best screen design that Sony or frankly anybody else, other cameras that I've used has ever come up with because it's so versatile and can be used in so many different situations. And being able to actually tap on the screen and change some of the settings really quickly makes this camera a lot faster to navigate and get around. One of the things that did get my attention was battery life. Now, while most Sony cameras have pretty good battery life, the A1 definitely suffers a little bit. The A93 seems to do a little better than the A1, but it definitely eats up batteries if you're using things like the AI autofocus, if you're shooting a lot of high-speed photos, or the dynamic active stabilization. Now, they do, they do do okay in the cold, but it's really important to keep your batteries warm when you're using them in the cold. They definitely did seem to drain a little faster when we were on the mountaintops with the heli skiing, but a few batteries and we were able to get through the four hours roughly that we were out there, no problem. Now this camera is not the perfect camera for everybody. It's an amazing camera that comes at a really high price tag of $6,000. And if you wanna buy one, there are links in the description and buying through those links help me do what I do. While the price might seem outrageous, this is a high-end photo and video camera aimed at high-end professional users who can't afford to miss a shot because they're covering sporting events, they're trying to make sure they get that one shot with wildlife and they cannot afford to miss it, this camera is gonna be the tool for them. So what about me, somebody coming from the A1? I probably am gonna sell my A1 and get the A93 because I don't need 50 megapixels 99% of the time. And I, even though I love shooting 8K on the A1, it's fantastic. I really don't need it because everything I do is in 4K or even delivered in 1080 in most cases with clients. And I will have a whole video comparing the A1 and the A93 coming up. There are a few other downsides. One is the very limited ISO range. I routinely go out and film in incredibly dark environments. That's why I have an A7S III is I can shoot at ridiculously high ISOs under moonlight. The A93 is definitely not gonna be the camera for that. The only other question that I've not been able to answer is how well the camera ham handles overheating. Obviously, it's the winter time here in Alaska. I can't test overheating. I suspect that the camera will do well unless you're shooting in much higher frame rates in 4K or shooting a lot of burst mode photos in a really hot environment under direct sun. But other than those very specific situations, I don't see the camera having any issues with overheating. I'd really like to know what you think of the Sony A93 and is it a camera you're considering picking up? Let me know in the comments below. Next, you're gonna to wanna to watch this video over here. I'll see you over there. As always, if you have questions that maybe I didn't answer in this video, let me know in the comments below or join my live stream that happens most Wednesday nights at 4 p.m. Alaska time, 8 p.m. Eastern, where we can have more of a conversation Maybe I can answer things I didn't get to in this video. I'll see you soon. Cheers.